Hello and welcome to my April reading wrap up. Um, I read nine books in the month of April. However, I had a lot of two and three star reads in April. Um, don't love that, but did want to put a warning on this video that this is not going to be like the most positive of wrap ups. Um, which I know I'm I'm very particular with what I like in general, but I do feel like I had a more negative than usual month. Um, a lot of the books I read were really interesting, glad I read them, like worthwhile reads, just like not very highly rated. I had like two or four stars and everything else was two and three. Um, but May? Significantly better month. We are a week into May and like great month so far. So look, look for next month's wrap up if you want something a little bit more positive. But I'm going to get into everything that I read in the month of April. Starting off strong with two stars, I have A Thin Dark Line by Tammy Hoag. This is an adult fiction cop thriller about a detective who is a woman in Louisiana investigating a crime that has happened for whom the suspected killer got off. Essentially, he was on trial, it was deemed that some of the evidence was bad, so he was released, but everyone believes he committed this horrific murder. So it kind of follows the female cop the lead detective on the case, the dude who got arrested and set free, and then like the whole ensemble cast of characters. <laughs> I gave this two stars. I did actually quite like the writing style. Um, something I didn't know going into this book was that Tammy Hoag started out as a romance writer, so this definitely read more like romantic suspense than a straight thriller, which is fine. Um, I, I read one of her other books and did not get that at all, so it was a really interesting thing to learn. Um, not super my vibe, but like the actual case was kind of interesting. Like the way it was written was very dense, very long. Like it's it's a it's a thick book and it kind of just like goes into this ensemble cast of characters. And I really like dense cop thrillers where everyone is unlikable. Because <sighs> everyone was awful in this book. But the thing with books like that is that it really has to be intentional. Like you have to intentionally write them as awful people, which I, is why I love Karen Slaughter so much, because like all of the characters in her books are the worst and it's on purpose and you can hate them and like it's, you're kind of supposed to, like the book is written for you to hate them, which I love. Um, in this book, I don't think you were really supposed to hate them, which was a problem because the lead detective on the case, who is also the love interest of the main character, awful human being. Like, throughout this book, he committed assault, he kidnapped people, he threatened people, he broke into their homes, he gave one man a swirly. Like, grown man cop gave another man a swirly. Like, it, it was ridiculous. And like, he was an awful person. He should not have been a cop. He should have been fired like 18 times over for all the different things he did in this book. He should not have gotten together with the main character. Their romance was super gross. He was a terrible person. It also went into like this weird racist thing towards the end. Like, books like this usually tend to be racist. Like, to be honest, like they do. But this went into a very like explicit racist rant about like how she hated this one cop and he blamed a lot of things on racism and I'm like, this is set in the 90s. He is a black cop in the 90s in the southern United States. I fully believe that he has experienced a great deal of racism. Like, I, I don't really blame him for complaining about it. He experienced a lot in this book. He was one of the bad characters. Like, he was an awful person too, but like... Let's not discount the tons of racism he experienced and like, it was really sexist, um, intentionally so, mostly, but there are definitely a few times where I was like, this doesn't feel intentional, it just feels kind of sexist, but you know, it fell into a lot of those, like, it's a cop thriller written in the 90s, a lot of issues, um, but I, I did like the dense nature of it, had it been less problematic, I don't know, that's a vague word, but like, had it had it had fewer issues of prejudice and the the mainly detective just being awful, I, I probably would have given this three stars, but it did get kind of pleasant towards the end there. Then I read Out Now, Queer We Go Again, um, edited by Sandra Mitchell. This is a young adult short story collection of largely like contemporary and speculative LGBT plus stories. 
um, written by a variety of authors, variety of stories, different tones. I gave this two stars. I did like the first book in this series. There's three of them. The first one was historical fiction. This is like contemporary slash speculative slash a little bit of fantasy slash whatever they felt like jamming in. And then the final one, which I'm reading now, is science fiction. This was a weak point in the trilogy for me. It was not very good. I did not enjoy basically any of these stories. Like, I think there were two, maybe three, that I liked at all. And not even, like, that I thoroughly enjoyed. Just, like, there were a couple that I thought were fine. And largely, I actively disliked them. Um, partially, I think it wasn't for me like style wise it was a lot of like first person present tense type narrations where they're like kind of talking to the reader I don't really like that that's not really a style I jive with and there was a lot of that <laughs> I also was expecting this to be more contemporary and like it had some contemporary stories but it also had others that I felt like was really stretching it like there was one that was just literally about the Greek gods I'm like how even if you call this like contemporary slash speculative, it's literally about the Greek gods. Like this is straight fantasy. Um, I, I don't have much to say about this. I didn't really enjoy it. <laughs> like I, I didn't really like any of the stories. Again, there were like two or three that were fine, but none of those were even by authors that I would like to look up to read more from. It was mostly like, this was interesting but I don't think I would read this author again, that kind of vibe. There was also a story by Meredith Russo in here who is a wife beater, um, to put it mildly. Um, she's not a great person and they probably shouldn't have included her because I'm pretty sure this came out after she was, you know, arrested and admitted to everything. So that was kind of in an interesting choice. But yeah, this wasn't for me. I feel like if you like the style of like the main characters kind of talking to you in first person present tense and that like super casual way of like almost addressing the reader you would probably like this more than me but I didn't think this was a great collection and I don't think a lot of the authors in here were great short story writers because you I like short stories you do have to write them differently than you write novels because of the you know the length difference changes the way you structure the story and I feel like a lot of these were structured just like scenes from novels instead of short stories. Um, not great! <laughs> um, but yeah I was really disappointed in this and just it almost made me not want to continue on and read the next one but I am so hopefully the science fiction one will be better. <laughs> and then I listened to Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer which is a nonfiction book written by an indigenous um, ecologist and botanist. She has a PhD and she teaches college and um, interesting. Um, this was fascinating. I gave this four stars. I don't really know how to describe this because it has such like a broad subject. Like it's kind of just like she's an indigenous woman. She talks a lot about her culture and how that has affected the way she sees the world and the way she sees nature and plants and just the way that weaves into like sustainability and like ecology and like the way everything works together and how we are part of that system and it's also a lot about like her family and her raising of her two daughters and a lot about her teaching in college and some prejudice she has experienced but also just like the way that her indigenous culture has taught her to think about the land is so wildly different than the way you know her white professors taught her to think about the land and the way she's like weaved these two things together it was really really well done like I'm not doing it justice but it was just an absolutely fascinating book this has gotten so much hype like I don't even know who I heard talk about this to add it because I, I've heard a lot of people talk about how wonderful this book is and the audiobook was wonderful she narrates it herself and she has like this really soothing voice like almost a little too soothing at times like kind of energized it a little because I did get somewhat distracted and had to like rewind sometimes but like so well done um it was a little bit meandering for me at times like I would have liked it to be like slightly more focused because it did cover like everything and I feel like by the final like third 
it was getting to a point where it was sometimes losing me when it got, got off on like tangents and whatever and it could have been like the tiniest bit more focused but for the most part the meandering nature the broad subject really worked she told a lot of stories from her life she told a lot of stories or not stories but information <laughs> about like the natural world it's fascinating i highly recommend you pick this up if you have at all any interest in the world we live on <laughs> i don't know she's an incredibly intelligent incredibly educated woman um speaking from an interesting perspective i learned a lot but also it was just oh a wonderful read um I'm sure I'm not saying anything that everyone hasn't already said about this book, but go give it a read. Then I read The Always War by Margaret Peterson Haddix, which is a middle grade dystopian novel about a society in which there is a perpetual war, like for as long as the main character can remember, for as long as her parents can remember, for as long as her grandparents can remember, they have been at war with their neighboring country. But then a military hero comes home, he's suffering from PTSD, he's talking about how he's not a hero, he's a coward, the war is not a good thing, and she kind of follows him and they go on this adventure together and start learning things about the war that they didn't previously know. Um, this was nice, I gave it three stars, but I don't feel like it was one of Margaret Peterson Haddock's better books. I've read a fair amount from her and I really like her interesting perspective, her social commentary. It's wonderful for middle grade readers. They're always so interesting and I loved that about her when I was a kid. This one I felt like needed more development, needed more story. Nothing happened in like the first half of this book and it's not a very long book so for nothing to happen for like a hundred pages was kind of a struggle for me. And then it wrapped up super quickly at the end and the main character is very passive and I, I can like a passive main character like that can be very interesting and well done it's just it is harder to do and i don't feel like it was well done here i feel like we needed something a little bit more than what she gave us um this book kind of felt like half formed but i really like the commentary in it she talked a lot about like what it means to be at war and what it kind of means to be complicit in that war and like to have your eyes closed to what's going on around you it was absolutely fascinating um i have a full review on this if you kind of want my thoughts more in depth but this book needed more but it was still very very interesting then i read endless love by scott spencer which has been one of my most anticipated reads for like the last eight years <laughs> I finally got around to it and I gave it three stars so that was lovely. Um, this is the story of a teenage boy who is madly in love with his girlfriend and then he gets banished from her house. Um, it's kind of just like hey like this is going like too far. My daughter needs space from you so her father banishes him from the house from communicating with his daughter for a month and he does not want to be banished. He wants to ingratiate himself back into the family so he decides the best way to do this is to set their house on fire so that he can come in and save the day which it goes about as bad as you would expect that plan to go he winds up being locked up against his will in a psychiatric hospital and then he gets out and decides to stalk the family and this is kind of like the premise this is not like me getting to the halfway point this is like the first like 30 pages of the book and he kind of like because this is taking place years after the fire and he kind of just like decides to track down the family and like see what his ex-girlfriend has to say and like get back in touch with her mother and like rebuild these relationships that he has destroyed. The whole book is told from his perspective which was 100% my favorite part. He is such a creepy messed up individual which is like this terrible perception of the world like it's so wrong like this man sees nothing wrong with setting a house on fire so that he can come in and be the hero he's like this makes sense my biggest flaw here was that i walked away from the house so long that it burned to the ground and it's like that is not the issue here like that's not a good thing but that's not the main issue here and the whole thing was from his perspective so it was like talking about the way he sees the world and like normalizes it to a degree like his sexism his prejudice like the horrible way he treats people the self-absorption of every thought and it 
normalizes it in this really interesting way. Like, his perspective was so well done. I really, really love that. But I kind of just felt like this book didn't really have anything else. Like, like, it was really cool in that one element, but everything else was just kind of like, why am I here? Like, why am I following this story? I don't care about anything that's happening. It's interesting, but I'm not invested. And I don't know, it was kind of like mediocre outside of that. It didn't really offer a whole lot. The story wasn't great. There wasn't really much character development. I didn't care. And I don't know, it was like interesting enough. Like, I'm so glad I read this. It was worth the read, but I just like, the perspective was not enough for me to carry this book. It needed a little bit more. And it was just like, kind of lacking but still worthwhile like if you're someone who like that could carry a book for you like this interesting twisted perspective I'd recommend this like it was a super messed up book like oh like the graphic sex scenes were like the worst thing I've ever read <laughs> in like the grossest way like oh I gagged like this dude sucked a blood clot out of his girlfriend's veg like send help um <laughs> it was so gross it was so terrible I really enjoyed the grossness and the terribleness of this book, but it's like, what else was there? Kind of nothing. So, I don't know. It was, it was a three-star read. It was an interesting book, but I will probably not think about this for very long. Then I read Superior, The Return to Race Science by Angela Saini, which was recommended to me by Abby from Abby of Palinora. I will link her channel down below. Definitely go check her out. I gave this four stars. Um, oh, I had three four star books this month. I forgot about that. Slightly more positive. Um, this was wonderful. This was a nonfiction book that I listened to via audiobook about race science and essentially how racism and science have been intertwined. And it's about eugenics and it's about how racism uses science to defend its prejudice and also how racism has influenced science. And it's, it's really, really interesting. It covers history, but it's a lot about like modern day and like what the racists are doing today, kind of like, and it, it she interviews a lot of people who are like involved in science that involves race, both in negative ways and somewhat positive ways, question mark. Um, and she talks a lot about how like race isn't a real thing scientifically speaking and how the limitations of like studying genetics and stuff like that and it was just a little bit over my head I am not a very scientifically inclined person I've discussed this before I am much more in the English side of education than I was in you know science so it was like a tiny bit over my head but I could still follow it all really well she did a really good job of just like explaining it for, you know, the average reader like me, who's not a scientifically inclined person. Because, like, I, I understood what she was getting at. She did a really good job of explaining the terms and, like, these high arching and, like, these highbrow scientific experiments and things that were happening. And was like, I understood the principles of these things, even if I didn't get the details. So she did a great job of that. And it was just really, really interesting. Um, if you are interested in the subject matter, I would highly recommend. It was well worth the time I spent reading it. And then I read Domestic Pleasures by Beth Guccion. Um, I read Still Missing by her a couple years back and really loved that book. So I was like, let's read another one. And, and this was kind of a letdown. I gave this two stars. This is described as a romance between a woman whose ex-husband has just died in an airplane crash and his divorce lawyer who basically destroyed her life as best he could. Um, so they fall in love. This book was a whole lot more than that. I gave it two stars. It was weird. It was not necessarily super well done. It's an ensemble book, which I wasn't expecting based on that description. It kind of said nothing on the back about being an ensemble book, but it is. Like, it follows everyone. Like, if you assume the main characters are the, the Martha and Charlie, the divorce attorney, it follows, you know, their kids, it follows 
their other significant others because they date many people in these books. It follows their kids' significant others. It follows Charlie's ex-girlfriend's sister's children. Like, this is not an exaggeration. We spend a lot of time with his ex-girlfriend's sister's kids. She had three in a very problematic marriage. And you can do a really interesting ensemble book. Like, you can. I've read them. But this just felt so purposeless. Like, I didn't dislike the story of those children more than, like, anyone else's in this book. But it was just like, why am I reading about them? Like, what are they contributing here? Like, nothing? It felt really purposeless. And then they were all, like, horrible people and horrible parents. Like, oh my gosh. Like, I can read a book that's full of characters that I don't like. But again, it has to be on purpose, like in Endless Love, it was on purpose. Like we were not supposed to like that dude. He was a terrible dude and I loved his perspective. In this, I hated all of these people, but I kind of got the vibe that I wasn't supposed to hate all of these people, that I was supposed to like them or find them funny. And like this dude, Charlie, let's focus on Charlie because he's the one I hated most, but like keep in mind, I didn't like anyone in this book. Charlie treated his teenage daughter so horribly throughout this entire book. Like he literally called her a little beast more than once. He called her narcissistic and self-absorbed and despicable. And it's just like, that's your kid. Like, how are you treating your child like this? And then you wonder why she is struggling. Like she wasn't even a bad kid. She was just a troubled kid who was struggling. And if you want to know why she's troubled, look at her freaking parents. Like, I too would be struggling if I was 15 and my father was referring to me as a narcissistic despicable little beast. Like, oh, I hated him. And like, none of these parents knew where their kids were at three o'clock in the morning. Like literally, there was one night where they woke up and were like, huh, that's odd. It's 3 a.m. and my children are not here. And the kids called and were like, hey, we're somewhere else. And they were like, huh. And I was like, no one. Like, there are like eight different parents in this book. Not a single one of them has any idea where their child is at three o'clock in the morning. Like, I liked the writing style. It was very reminiscent of Still Missing, which I loved, but it was just like, I don't understand what the purpose was here. Like, why am I following these people and their relationships? I don't like them. So like, what else is there? And kind of nothing. This was so nothing. And I don't know, I will never think about this again. Like, this is one of those books that like, now that I'm done with it, it's over for me. <laughs> like, I will never have another thought about this. It's just, I don't know, it was kind of an unfortunate book, especially considering how much I loved Still Missing. Then I read Wishbone by Julie Marie Wade, which is a nonfiction. Um, it's called A Memoir in Fractures. It's lyric essay. It's really gorgeously written. Um, I gave this four stars. I loved the writing in this. Like everything she wrote was absolutely beautiful and breathtaking and stunning and just like so gorgeous. Like the words she chooses, beautiful. If you like poetry, you would probably really love this. Like if you like kind of memoir type poetry, a lyric essay is kind of a cross between like an essay and a poem. And it was just Oh, so gorgeous. Like everything in this book was so quotable and just I found myself rereading because it was just like the language was so lovely that I was just like, let's reread that sentence. Let's reread this sentence. Let's just like reread this entire passage. It was gorgeous. Um, loved that. There was one part in this book I didn't like. Um, they're like, it's told in like, I think five parts. Um, I did not like this second one. It's essentially like, She's imagining this kind of like dreamlike state where she goes back in time and meets her parents and her family before she was born. So when they're like 20 and she's like 20, she's like going back to meet them. And it was like really weird. I get what she was trying to do there and like the vibe she was trying to go for, but it really didn't work for me, unfortunately. Um, but the rest of this, I did really enjoy. She did such a good job of like capturing brief moments and tying them together. So it's like not literally cohesive, but it has this very cohesive vibe. Um, it was beautifully done. It's just a wonderfully crafted book. Like she must have spent so much time making this absolutely perfect because it was. Um, highly recommend if you like this kind of thing. I had such a wonderful time reading it. And then the final thing I read was Women who love men who kill by Sheila Eisenberg. 
This is a nonfiction true crime book about women who love men who kill. Um, funny that I give this two stars. Um, in case you were interested in, in reading this book, let me save you about 230 pages. These women are damaged. The end. That was basically her premise here. These women are damaged and thus they seek love in men who are behind bars and probably never getting out. That's about it. Um, it was really bland. It was really shallow. She was so condescending to these women. It made my skin crawl. Like, I don't understand how you can treat the subjects of your books that way. Like, she was, I assume she interviewed these women, but the way it was written, it was so hard to tell. And I don't know if she was getting some of this from, like, interviews, like, that they did with, like, other news sources. Um, hard to tell. But she was, the women would say things like, oh, I like xyz about the man and she would be like oh but they don't really mean that what they actually mean is this and it was throughout this entire book and it was maddening like she offered no evidence for that she would just contradict what these women are thinking they're like i think this and she's like these women don't actually think that they just believe that they think that what they actually think is the premise of you know my my psychological theory here which is that they're damaged and it was so frustrating to read. And then she would use that evidence, you know, that like, these women would be like, I believe he's innocent. And she would be like, well, actually, you don't believe he's innocent. And then, and then she would use the fact that they don't actually believe he's innocent to support her like psychological theories of these women and why they love men who are murderers. And it's like, very circular of like, you're proving that they don't believe that these men are innocent with your psychological theory, which is upheld by the fact that they don't believe these men are innocent. And it's like, you don't actually have any evidence here. You're just talking yourself in circles. It was maddening. I hated it. And she also included a lot of quotes from various psychologists who seemed more like pop psychologists focused on peddling their own books. And like, they had stupid theories like soul murder that they used. And like, it was annoying. And the other psychologists would like constantly diagnose these women with various things and like describe why they're doing this. And I kind of got the vibe that none of those psychologists had ever actually spoken to these women, which is kind of inappropriate and gave me super yikes vibes. And just this whole thing was poorly done. Like, I don't know what I expected. <laughs> I should have DNF this and I didn't. It's not great. Like, interesting subject matter. And to be honest, I didn't really disagree with a lot of what she was saying. It was just so poorly done that it was maddening and I hated it. So, two stars. Um, Not worth the time that I spent reading it. So that was everything that I read in April. I did really love three of the books. They were all wonderful. So, all nonfiction too. I had good nonfiction this book and bad everything else, so... I don't know. Um, let me know if you've ever read any of these and what you thought of them if you have. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see y'all again soon.